effort is manifesting is in something as not simple, but perhaps has been overlooked, perhaps, is the waiting rooms, right? And what people experience when they walk through the doors. And so through the leadership of um, Associate Commissioner Ralph DeFiori and uh, Claudia Hinkson, they are leading an improvement team in efforts to improve the waiting room so that when people enter, they uh, not just are going to access the services and opportunities that we're talking about, but that they'll be well received, there'll be an atmosphere um, of, of, of productivity, of success, and an at, at, asset-based uh, approach to reaching the success that we all want to achieve. Uh, I'd like to bring back Vinny, Robin. All right, so um, before I give my final remarks and open it up to questions, I just want to make a real point of thanking Carlos Ruiz, Mike Caputo, John Corrigan, Matt Fischler, and Ryan Dodge for oh, somebody benched. <laughs> yeah, the bottom right square is gone. Um, I guess they didn't clap loud enough for Carlos. <laughs> uh, and Ryan Dodge for really making this uh, you know, successful and uh, all, they, they did all the good work, all the mistakes were ours. So everybody give a big round of applause. Okay. Uh, so Clinton ended uh, by talking about incentives and uh, he and I have been talking a lot about that lately. Um, I think we already know a fair amount about incentives from our own experiences and from the research, uh, which shows it's better uh, uh, as a motivator of behavior change than punishments are or the threats of punishments are. The research is pretty clear that you need to give four incentives for every sanction you give. Um, we also know that early discharge is a big motivator of people on probation and people on parole supervision. Uh, there's some research literature on that, but there's also just when I was doing a focus group with you, I was doing a focus group with people on probation, and they were this one kid at, at Cases I did a focus group with. He was one of our probationers. Uh, we talked about, oh, you know, we're thinking about some positive incentives like time off probation, and, you know, we were thinking of something like six months off if you got a GED, and the kid said, six months off? I'd get a PhD. <laughs> so I think it's a pretty powerful form of uh, um, But, you know, for us, we need, we need, feedback on this now from our team of experts, which is all of you, right? So we, we don't want to sit up in Beaver Street and say, okay, this would be good incentives for probationers. I'm not working on probationers every day. You folks are. So what I've asked Clinton to do is to chair an incentives <coughs> improvement team to really have us all hunker down and have a discussion about what would motivate probation. So sure, it's going to be uh, time off, and we've already talked about that, uh, and we want to tie that to the individual achievement plans. But also, there are other things, and, and, and there's a lot of research out there, and it. it's, it's, it's some, somewhat surprising. So, because people try to pay people to do things, right, or give them gift certificates, and, and sometimes those intangible rewards, like a plaque, or a ceremony, or a pat in the back, or just a, hey, you've come on time, you know, every week for the last month. I, I, I want to I wanna give you a shout out on that. You know, just some of those informal things are actually shown to be better than a McDonald's gift certificate or a $25 check. So I'm not going to prejudge the work of the committee, but I want you guys to really get in there and struggle with it um, and, and, and come up with a way for us to really up our game on this this year. Um, I don't want it just to be about early release. I want there to be a, a whole sequence of things we can do, some of which are, are real immediate. Because remember, early release doesn't occur for a while. Even if you get, you know, even if you do it well, just got on probation, when you touch early release, is way to head down the line. There's a lot of other things that we can do that I think you all can figure out and make up and invent, experiment with that I think will really help motivate people. So that's what the incentives improvement team uh, is and Cliff is going to chair it. Uh, stay tuned for details on how to join that. Um, on one page over there, so unfortunately I had a backup. Um, so, I got it. Final page, so that's what we plan. I hope you're as excited about it as we are. It goes without saying that none of this is going to be possible without your help. Keep sending your ideas to us at communications at probation.nyc.gov. 
keep joining the committees, including uh, the, the, the newest announced one, um, and keep taking the initiative. Together we can make the New York City model of probation the gold standard for the country. People are already looking to us uh, on, on what we're doing. And uh, I think there's, there's actually a pretty tremendous amount of interest around the country about the direction that we're taking. And I'll take a few questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to start, because you guys always feel like you're the last ones, we're going to start with Staten Island, right? Uh, uh, 130 stops in place. You guys get to ask the first question. So you got to hit your mute button to ask the question. Unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the question is what things specifically were or are being done to reduce costs to prevent layoffs and demotions? What staff will be affected? Probation officers, support staff, management positions, and what are the timetables? Um, uh, one thing that we did right away was we got rid of the, um, the Jamaica office, which we were just about to sign a renewed lease on. And that's uh, over a hundred thousand. Hundred eighty-seven thousand. What did you say? I thought it was a hundred thousand, but it's a lot of money uh, that, to, that would save people from having to get laid off. And we, you know, we consolidated in Jamaica, so we only have two offices there instead of three now that we're getting rid of that one, which will happen next month. The other thing is we've cut a bunch of uh, IT stuff in terms of copy machines and whatnot. We've got rid of a bunch of cars. We're trying like heck to get out of Beaver Street. I want out of Beaver Street completely. It's a huge amount of money to be there. I mean, it's nice offices, but in times like this, it's, a, it's a, an extravagance as far as I'm concerned. The bad news is we signed the lease right before I got here, and it's a 15-year lease. So we're negotiating, but in some ways that's, that's bad. But in some ways, it's good because if, we, if we're trying to negotiate with other city agencies to move in, and if you only have like a year or two left, it, it's not as attractive. So if you actually are thinking of moving in, having, a, having 14 years left on a lease for another city agency is pretty attractive. So we were able to get rid of two floors uh, to the Taxi and Limousine Commission uh, people, and I met the taxi and limousine guy the other day, David Gasky, I fairly mugged the guy because I was like, do you need any more space? He was like, who the hell is the probation? Why is this guy on probation? Like, so after me. And I was like, I don't know, I'll go to DCAS. Um, but we are going to DCAS. Michael uh, is on it. Uh, he's meeting with DCAS trying to sort of push them to get us the heck out of there, and that'll save us millions more. And, you know, what percent of our budget is personnel services? 80%. Eight, 80%. Yeah, so about 80 percent of our budget is personnel services, so we don't really have that much wiggle room, but we're going to try and squeeze wherever we can squeeze, and we're squeezing somewhat so far. Bronx, it's at 100, 198 East, 161st Street in the Bronx. Good morning, Commissioner Executive Staff. Um, in terms of the case uh, transferring process to reporting and without compromising public safety and the delivery of services to our clients, has there been any further uh, thought about placing probationers with less than two years left on a non-reporting category or maybe uh, for them to report quarterly? I understand that the department had some form of this about 20 years ago. But I think during this period of time, we could also submit an early discharge. Also, I think this would be a huge incentive to our probationers. It would be cost effective, and it would allow us to use our resources more effectively. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, uh, hit your mute button again, OK? Um, the, I just want to finish the question from Staten Island, because there was also a question about when people will know who's going to get laid off and all that stuff. There's a whole bunch of rules about this, and I'm sort of learning them. Unfortunately, I'm learning them the hard way because we've had to do two rounds of layoffs. And so we have to tell the Office of Labor Relations. The Office of Labor Relations then calls the affected unions, and they convey that information, and they're pretty strict about them being the ones that do it and not us. So earlier on, I said, we'll get you as much information as we can as soon as we can get it. And, and I meant that, but what you need to know is the rules preclude me from being able to be the one to say, it's going to be this person, it's going to be that person. That's 
pretty strictly the Office of Labor Relations protocol with our union members, uh, I mean, with our union representatives. So that's the way the information flows, uh, and, uh, and we're trying to be as open in that conversation as we can, but we got some rules we got to follow. <coughs> Two years left, uh, question now, to back to the Bronx. Um, I have never heard this suggestion before. Um, it feels to me, just gut-wise, and I, I do want you to hit your mute button again because I want, I want you to respond, that what should drive our decision for early discharges a good behavior or meritorious behavior as opposed to how much time you got left. Uh, I certainly think that time matters, right? So if you've been compliant or good on probation for three years, certainly the, the two year remaining should, you know, that's a good time to start to say, hey, you know, the most impactful time on probation for the first 18 months, uh, person's got two times 18 months under their belt. Um, but I believe that the current protocols that were just established really speak to that. They speak to the amount of time and compliance that allows you to step down from high risk to kiosks and then step down from kiosks to early discharge requests. So I believe if you've been compliant for three years, you should, the protocols should prescribe step downs. In fact, they, they presume step downs. Did I get that wrong? Right, absolutely, Commissioner. What I'm referring to also is um, putting them on a non-reporting category while we begin to assess the case for early discharge. I think you're saying that with, while they're on reporting, there is a category, like if you were on felony probation and you went straight to reporting, the time you have to be on reporting is longer than anybody else. And I think you're saying within that time, can they even report less to the uh, kiosk? That's what you're asking, right? Yeah. Wonder. Yes. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, what, so one, it's a great question. We did consider that on supervision, which we basically said we're giving the professionals more discretion that within the protocols, if you believe this person is doing very, very exceptionally well, that you can, with your supervisor's approval, step them down further within supervision. But we did not put that within reporting. So I think that's a great question that should be uh, considered. And as we said in the training, that this is the first iteration, um, and uh, Clinton and others will be looking to put out new versions of this, and I, I would say that that's something that we should uh, consider. Yeah, you know, what might be the best is, because now you've got the new protocol, so there's something to, to experience and, and, and play with and live with, but what probably would be good is for people to start sending in suggestions to how to amend them now, because we had also some discussion about the sex offender step-down process, and that's a, I think that's a good conversation for us to have as a, as a group, as a team, and for us to come to consensus around. Um, we did a lot of back and forth discussion as these protocols are being developed, but that doesn't mean that we can't do more, that we can't learn more. We're not, you know, God didn't hand these to Moses on Mount Sinai. We didn't edge them in stone, right? We can adjust them and change them and improve them based on you guys' experience and you guys' ideas. So what I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna ask Clinton to do is to be the recipient of these ideas and then to bring them back to